we are really excited that you chose to spend your St. Patty's Day with us this evening. We're very honored. Um, I think this is really going to be a fantastic panel. Um, so with that, I think we will go ahead and get started here. Um, so this event called Clues to the Cottage, how the Montpelier team unraveled one building story is about this Madison planter's cottage and the stories and history associated with that structure. So tonight we'll be hearing from the archeologists, historic preservationists and researchers who worked on this project um, to learn about the structure and its uses um, over time. So this building was once occupied by James Madison Jr. who was the fourth president of the United States as well as his parents and siblings. Um, and this building also eventually served as a kitchen and home for an enslaved cook. So this panel will really demonstrate how kind of this collaboration between these different disciplines helped uncover the building's past, giving us a fuller, more accurate account of the past. Um, so to kick off, I want to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Matthew Reeves, who's the Director of Archaeology at James Madison's Montpelier. In his 20 years at Montpelier, Matt has developed a strong public archaeology program known for its citizen science and community-based research approach with a heavy focus on investing descendant communities in the research and interpretation process. We also have Hillary Hicks, who is the senior research historian at James Madison's Montpelier. Hillary came to Montpelier in 2010 and joined the research department in 2011 where she conducts documentary research in support of the Montpelier Foundation's many programs. She served on the research and writing team for the award-winning exhibition, The Mere Distinction of Color, and is currently writing biographies of the enslaved people for the naming project on Montpelier's digital doorway website. We also have Tessa Honeycutt, who is an architectural, uh, ar yeah, technician in architecture and historic preservation department at Montpelier. And Tessa sorts and organizes architectural records relating to the restoration. Uh, she also aids in the management of the 3D model of the Madison House. Joining us from Colonial Williamsburg tonight is Jennifer Wachowski, who began her career at James Madison's Montpelier, working on the architectural restoration of the mansion. After completion, she moved to Williamsburg and worked with the Messick Cohen Wilson Baker Architects. But she returned to Montpelier in 2015, where, as the Director of Architecture and Historic Preservation, she oversaw the construction of Madison's outbuilding in the South Yard, as well as other preservation activities. Uh, Jennifer joined the Grandeur Department of Ar uh, Architectural Preservation and Research in 2020 as the Shirley and Richard Roberts Architectural Historian, and has been focused on architectural research and design in Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area. And I also want to note that uh, Dr. Mary Furlong Minkoff, uh, who was not able to join us this evening for the panel, um, was also a major part of kind of envisioning what this panel looked like. Um, so she is the Assistant Director of Archaeology and Curator of Architectural, uh, I'm sorry, Archaeological Collections at Montpelier. And she was really this galvanizing force behind the panel. Um, so even though she's not here uh, tonight, I just wanted to recognize her contributions. Um, to the discussion this evening. Uh, so with Mary that introduction, have, oh, sorry, Mary would have been, had a hard time with the discussions. I heard her voice this morning and it was non-existent. Oh, so. And the <laughs> archaeology. Have to read her eyes. Yeah, and you guys have an expedition going on this week. So I know she's giving a lot of probably lectures or talking a lot. So um, yeah, she'll be missed, but um, we are, I think, going to hear a lot of great information from Matt and other folks. Um, so with that, I want to kick it over to you, Matt, uh, to give us kind of an overview of the Planters Cottage and where it's located on the landscape. Yeah, I will go ahead and share screens. Um, we've developed a, uh, a story map for this uh, program that we're going to be sharing with you all um, uh, after uh, probably uh, maybe a week after that we, we've um, finished the, uh, the presentation tonight. And we want to build it up based on some of the questions that you all have. But as Katie mentioned, I wanted to start this out with giving the, you know, some literal context to where Mount Pleasant is and where the Montpelier Main House is in relationship to each other. Uh, we're going to be focusing for the most part on the um, up in the area of the Main House. But this is a view from a drone looking, basically flying right above the Madison Family Cemetery and looking towards the Montpelier Main House. 
The Mount Pleasant site that I'm going to talk about next is uh, just to the uh, uh, to the to the um, uh, northeast of the cemetery, and then past the visitor center is the main house. But when James Madison's parents were initially married in, in uh, uh, September 15, 1749. Thanks for that date, Hillary. Um, this is what Mount Pleasant would have looked like. This was the, the home, uh, home that was managed by um, James Madison's grandmother, uh, Frances Taylor Madison. She was a widow at the time period. And when, J when James Madison's parents, James Madison Sr. and Nellie Conway Ma Madison were married in 1749, it's unclear whether they lived with um, uh, James Madison Sr.'s mother, Frances um, Taylor, uh, uh, or, or I'm sorry, um, Frances Taylor Madison uh, for the, the first year or so of their marriage. But we do know that James Madison, the future president, when he was uh, born in, uh, in March of 1751, he was born at his mother's childhood home in Port Conway, which is east of Fredericksburg. And a month later they arrived. And whatever the decision one was, by that point, we think that's when the, uh, the original planner's cottage had, had been built. And that's what we're gonna be discussing today. And for the first, you know, tw uh, 25 years or for the first 10 years of Madison's life, 10 to 15 years, what we know about the what was up at the mansion landscape was what appears here. This is a slider that shows what the landscape looked like in um, in 1776. But in early in 1751, the only building that we know that was there based on the archaeology was this planter's cottage. And by by sometime in, in uh, 1765, the main house had been built. Now, why James Madison's parents decided to, um, to build a separate house before they built the original main house is, might have something to do with um, wanting to separate, establish a separate household away from uh, Francis Madison. Um, but what is clear is the family seat remains down at Mount Pleasant up until 1765, based on the Denver chronology of the main house. And what, what this appears to coincide with is Francis uh, dies, Francis uh, Madison dies in 1761. And it's after that, that the main house that we know is the core of the main house today begins to be built by Madison, the Madison enslaved uh, uh, community. And at that time when it's built, when Madison was you know, in his, in his uh, late teenage years and, and starting, starting Princeton, the College of New Jersey, what the house would have looked like when it was built was this Georgian affair with a balanced layout of outbuildings. And what would, have been, what would have been very dominant on the landscape would have been a massive blacksmith complex off to the north here where um, uh, today the temple exists. Now, one of the first changes that happens to this landscape occurs in uh, 1797. That's when the portico was added to the front of the house along with the duplex addition being added on the north side. And this was to allow James Madison and his new wife, Dolly, Dolly um, uh, uh, Payne Todd Madison, to establish their own household separate from the parents' household who were occupying the main core of the, uh, the main house. And at that time, the surrounding landscape appears not to have been changed that much based on what we found with archeology. span um, unfortunately, we don't have any records or images of this time period about what the house or the landscape looked like. This con these conjectural models that I'm showing right uh, in, on the screen here, these are based on um, both the archaeology and the architectural investigations that, uh, that the UVA's uh, Institute for Advanced uh, Technology and Humanities used to build this 3D rendering of what the house looked like. So while the landscape and um, doesn't change too much, you know, when Madison uh, uh, leaves to become Secretary of State in 1801. By 1806 to the 1808 period, right when he, he's elected president, there are massive changes that begin to be planned and happen at Montpelier. And one of the main changes is the addition of wings to the house. And then uh, what occurs with this as well is an even larger change to the landscape where um, all of the, if you notice in the front of the house here, you have these uh, dependencies in, the, in basically what appears to be the front lawn of the house. 
And then the, the, what we'll be talking about today, this planter's cottage and the, and the spinning house is there in the 18th century. And when you look at the layout of the grounds by 1826, while these two buildings are, are still here, what's also added are the two duplexes, the two smokehouses, and there's this massive change to the landscape where basically the Madisons are preparing for retirement, which they begin in 1817. And they begin to entertain hundreds of guests that travel through the Virginia Piedmont to have garden fets in the back lawn uh, and walk through the garden and you know, make observations about the pine alley and, and the, uh, the grove. Now, the, during this time, what was the planter's cottage uh, up until 1765, and then later we think might have been an office, in the 1820s, this is used as a kitchen for the south side of the house, which would have been uh, managed by Madison's mother, Nellie Conway Madison, who lives to the age of 1829. After she dies in 1829, what we found is the, 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 this, the planter's cottage goes away. And this, you know, within a period of about um, uh, another 20 years after her death, what happens at Montpelier is there's quite large changes to the landscape. The house remains much the same, but all the buildings aside from the temple are removed from the landscape. So by the time you get to 1851, this is about six years after Dolly sells the property, Dolly Madison sells the property and all the enslaved community, all of the outbuildings are gone. And we think that person, uh, the, the uh, owner who's responsible for these changes is either Moncure, uh, uh, Henry Moncure buys the property or potentially um, uh, the, uh, the, the subs two subsequent owners um, uh, who made the changes to the, uh, to the front landscape. Now, so by the time you get to eight, 1851, this 25 year increment, Mr. Madison has been in his grave for about 15 years. And uh, you know, part of you know, what we're gonna be talking to about today you know, is this legacy. In 1820 and in 1836, when Madison was buried at the Madison Family Cemetery, this is what the cemetery looked like. Within, uh, you know, about uh, probably uh, 30 to, to 40 years, that's when most of the, um, the gravestones have been placed in the cemetery, including this massive obelisk that actually, if you come out to Montpelier uh, this Saturday, I'm going to be giving a tour talking about memorialization of the landscape between and contrasting the Madison Family Cemetery and the, uh, the Slave Cemetery. And so um, uh, with that kind of returning back to this larger, larger landscape, you know, today, all of this space, you know, south of the, of the visitor center is this farm complex that we're studying today. Back in the day, this would have been, you know, the 18, in the 1820s, a farm complex. But what we're focused on is up at the, uh, the main house with the uh, planter's cottage. And so what I wanted to do is establish some context for what, what happened around the planter's cottage for these uh, 70 years after it was initially built and uh, allow us to get into um, the discussion with an understanding of the broader context here. So I'm gonna stop sharing screens now and uh, uh, bring us back to the panel here. Thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you for putting that story map together. Um, I think the visuals are really helpful. And uh, as you mentioned, that story map, um, based on kind of the conversation today and, and the audience questions, we'll be building that out. And that will be a resource available on our website um, down the line in the future. Um, so that's an exciting thing to stay tuned to. So um, as you were kind of talking, Matt, uh, you mentioned a couple of different terms associated with this structure. So this is referred to um, by folks at Montpelier as James Madison's boyhood home, the Madison family starter home, the planter's cottage, the kitchen. So you kind of hinted at it, but what exactly is the structure? Like how, how was it used over time and, and what should we call it an in interpretation and why? Yeah, that for the uh, for the structure, I could go ahead and, and start with that if you if you want, um, Katie. Uh, you'll notice behind me is an image of the archaeology of the Planters College, and as we initially found it as an archaeology site, it, this was first found by archaeologists in the early 1990s, and then we came back and did full ex full excavations in 2016 as part of the um, 
restoration of the, of the South Yard and the reconstruction that Jennifer saw, what we found was what we and were interpreting as a kitchen. Um, you'll notice in the in the uh, my background behind me, there's this uh, massive chimney base that's right here. In the area around the uh, the kitchen, we had found very uh, heavy deposits of trash. There there is a number of ceramics that dated to uh, the 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 mid to late 18th century. Uh, what's called Wilden, Wilden uh, Wares or uh, Cloud and Tortoise Wares that we were able to associate with Nellie Conway Madison's table. And so given the interpretation that this side of the house and this kitchen was being used to prepare um, uh, Nellie Conway Madison's meals, it made sense that her dinner wares when they broke were be thrown out by what would have been the kitchen. And there's a number of food food materials and other household um, items that were suggestive that they were coming from um, uh, Mother Madison's side of the house. Um, and then when this started to change was when we found, you can see a little bit of it right here, what was a pile of bricks. And when we started looking at that pile of bricks, I'm gonna show you a close up of this behind me, is this turned out to be much more than just a pile of bricks. It turned out to be the top of the chimney. And if I switch back to this slide right here, what you can see where, I don't know if you can see where my, um, you probably can't see where my hand is. I'm, I'm gonna need no, to sorry, we can't see. Yeah, that's right. Is <laughs> where I'm pointing right here, this is the, uh, the chimney base as we found it. This turned out to be the inside of the chimney. And what we how we were able to understand that is there are creosote deposits, black creosote deposits from fires that had built up along this area. And we were like, you know, looks like the chimney fell over. Interesting. This is, you know, be amazing. Jen will be really excited about this. And when we had uh, Jen come and look at this with some of the Masons and other, other folks who were at Montpelier at the time, one thing that was noticed was this, uh, this really interesting feature, which is a, um, uh, a, a band of uh, plaster. And what it turned out to match was the banded um, chimneys that are at the main house. And Jen, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about the significance of this and some of the archeology span that we found with this. Sure. So architecturally speaking, that plaster band is called a plaster necking and you can actually see it uh, on the <laughs> chimney here at Pear Valley. Um, and that's something that you normally see in um, dwellings, domestic structures. So to see that on an outbuilding was a little curious. Um, and that I think was one of the first steps of, of trying to figure out, well, maybe this is not just an outbuilding, maybe it's something special. Um, and we looked at that, we looked at um, the chimney base uh, and the brick uh, and, and figured out that there's actually a brick end wall on the building as well, which makes it even more likely that it was uh, set up as a dwelling uh, at first. Uh, rather than just a, an outbuilding. And you can actually see behind me too on the Pear Valley example, that's a whole brick um, end wall. Um, and so all of these together really uh, made me question what we were looking at. And so um, I work with a bunch of architectural historians that are experts in their field. We had them out to the site um, and I, I asked them, I said, could this be a dwelling and not just uh, an outbuilding or a kitchen? And their answer was yes, definitely. Um, and so that started the whole process of looking at the documents, looking at the archeology span and looking at comparative examples of standing structures within um, the Chesapeake region. So Maryland and Virginia and really started the process of, of trying to figure out what this building was originally. Hillary, can you talk a little bit about what the documentary record says about this place? Sure. Uh, so there's really nothing in the documentary record that definitively says what this building was. But there's three things that I'd like to look at with you that are very interesting and suggestive of possibilities. And the first is James Madison Sr.'s account book A, which you see behind me. We are all learning how to be weather forecasters tonight. <laughs> um, and so in James Madison Sr.'s account book, 
uh, you have to excuse me, I really geek out over 18th century account books. So I have to tell you a little bit about accounting <laughs> before we move on. So what you're seeing here at the top of the page, it says um, Francis Conway. So on the left-hand side of the ledger, these are the things, these are the debentures, the, the things for which Francis Conway owes Madison Sr. And then what you're seeing on the right-hand side where it says Contra, that's how he's paying it off. And so it's kind of a, a, a little more sophisticated system of barter where you're not necessarily trading a pig for a chicken, but you're uh, writing down the value of the pig and later on you're balancing it with the value of chickens. Uh, this is not pigs and chickens. So Francis Conway on this page in 1751 is providing James Madison Sr. with a house bell from Mr. Shepherd for, six, for nine shillings and a common prayer book. And common prayer book would be the book of common prayer, which would be the basic te text for Anglican wor worship. And so the house bell and the prayer book are showing up as a credit on Conway's account. Now, what's interesting about this is this and a couple other things I'm gonna mention, these are all purchases that seem to suggest that in 1751, 52, 53, Madison Sr. is making purchases that suggest he's setting up his own household. So for example, buying his own common prayer book, um, he is going to have his own household that he's gonna be leading in prayer we know from his father's inventory, Ambrose Madison's inventory, that Ambrose Madison had two common prayer books and three other prayer books. So the Mount Pleasant household is well fixed for prayer books at this point. Um, so in addition to this, uh, 1751 in July, William Crittenden fixes up a house bell and makes a cradle for James Madison Sr., which of course that's what James Madison Jr. Has, got, has been placed in. Uh, William Crittenden puts locks on two doors. He mends four chairs for Madison Sr. Uh, Francis Conway, coming back to the page that we're on right here, if I duck over under, uh, 1752, he uh, procures a set of chinaware from Mr. Couts. So that's another indication of uh, Madison Sr. and Nellie having their own household. Also in 1752, John Crittenden makes a safe, mends six chairs, saws 116 feet of BW plank, which we assume is black walnut plank. Uh, 1752, Joseph Eve saws some BW plank for him. Uh, also James McGinnis saws 350 feet of BW plank for him. In May of 1753, James Walker makes a desk and bookcase and an easy chair, and Walker modifies several existing pieces of furniture. So he makes a leaf for an oval table and a leaf for a sideboard table. He mends a dressing table, puts hinges on a large table. And uh, 1754, Walker makes an easy chair. And 1754 also Captain Richard Winslow provides some cherry tree plank for Madison Sr. So you could ask a couple of questions. How do we know that these weren't items that Madison Sr. was accepting in payments in kind that he intended to resell them? I think maybe for all that planking, maybe that could be something he's gonna resell, but certainly the furniture, the repaired furniture, the uh, house bell and locks, that all seems to be things that Madison is buying for his own use. And then you can ask, how do we know that these weren't purchases for Mount Pleasant? When you look at Madison Sr.'s account book, he keeps things pretty, uh, pretty separate between what's his household and what is the business operation that he shares with his mother, Frances. So, uh, when you see how they track the tobacco that is made on the different quarters, it's very clear whether it's, it's branded with the initials for uh, Nellie and, and uh, Madison Sr. or for Madison Sr. and his mother, Frances. 
So it seems pretty clear that Madison Sr. is outfitting his own household in the early 1750s. And this is something that Ann Miller noted, uh, historian Ann Miller noted this when she wrote the Historic Structures Report for Montpelier in 2008. Uh, she didn't speculate on where exactly Madison Sr. was setting up his own household, but she did notice that. Okay, so that's our first bit of information. Second is a story that was repeated by a local historian, W.W. Scott, uh, writing in the early 20th century. And so Scott repeats a story that was told to him by John Willis, who was a great nephew of Madison. And John Willis says this is what Madison Jr., President Madison, told to him. So this is how Scott tells the story in his 1907 history of Orange County, Virginia. He writes, the first dwelling house stood not far from the cemetery in the direction of the present mansion. Colonel John Willis, a great nephew of James Jr., was told by him that the nucleus of the present structure was built when he was a mere lad, capable of carrying in his own hands some of the lighter furniture from the old house to the new, which would fix the date at about, eight, at about 1760. We know now from Denver chronology, it's more 1763, 65. And then uh, historian W.W. W. Scott repeats this story in a handwritten recollection found among his papers that was probably written in 1919. And in that, he says about 1760, when James Jr., to quote his own word, was big enough to carry light pieces of furniture from the old house to the new, the nucleus of the present mansion was built by his father three or 400 yards from the site of the old house. Now that estimate of distance is interesting because it's not really clear whether this is something that uh, John Willis passed along or just what uh, Scott is interpolating from his knowledge or his preconceptions. Uh, the distance, actual distance is about 470 yards. So Scott clearly thinks that the old house is uh, Mount Pleasant. But does that scenario really make sense? Even if the furniture was light, would young James Madison have carried it all that way? It would make a lot more sense if you're transporting furniture that far to take a wagon load of furniture at a time rather than just sending your teenage son with one Windsor chair at a time. Uh, so the story ends up being a lot more plausible if we assume that Scott was mistaken about which old house the goods were coming from. So if the Madisons had been living in the cottage, maybe with the intention of turning it later into a kitchen, young James Madison would only have to schlep a Windsor chair or a Pembroke table about 50 yards, which is pretty easy schlepping distance and too short a distance to bother with wagoning it. So this story doesn't prove that the Madison family was living in the kitchen slash planter's cottage, but the certain story certainly makes more sense if they were. And then my third bit of information is a comparable story that comes from the diary of Francis Taylor. Uh, this is Francis with an I, male Francis Taylor, was a nephew of female Francis Taylor Madison. So he's a cousin of uh, James Madison Sr. And Francis Taylor lived in the area. He kept a diary from 1786 to 1799, which is great fun to track the comings and goings of all the different people in Orange and who had dinner with whom and when. Um, and in 1799, Francis Taylor noted that his brother, Dr. Charles Taylor, had set up temporary living quarters in a kitchen after a fire had destroyed his house. So the house burned on February 13th of 1799. And Dr. Taylor's family went to stay with various neighbors. And the neighbors also stored the furnishings that had been rescued from the house by the enslaved laborers and others. And Dr. Taylor then hired a builder to build a new house. And he began obtaining building materials, plank and shingles and brick. And by late April, Dr. Taylor was gathering back his belongings. On April 26, Francis Taylor wrote that his brother was, quote, about, he was about getting kitchen prepared to move into. And on April 29th, Francis Taylor wrote, he, meaning Charles Taylor, he and part of the family went to live in his kitchen 
I just love that sentence. He and part of the family went to live in the kitchen, which just has sounds so different today. Uh, but by May of uh, May the 6th, Dr. Taylor was having people to dinner with him in the kitchen while his builder was at work on the house. And around October 20th, Dr. Taylor moved into his new house. Finally, on November the 7th, the workmen moved or removed. Uh, Francis Taylor uses both words in two different sentences. The workmen moved or removed the kitchen, which makes me wonder if the kitchen was also newly constructed and was intended to be moved or repurposed um, after the family moved into the new house. So again, this doesn't prove or disprove the idea that uh, Madison Sr.'s family lived in the kitchen while the main house of Montpelier was under construction, but it does show that living in a kitchen was seen as a reasonable option for temporary housing. So just to sum up the documentary end, we have an account book uh, indicating that Madison Sr. was setting up a household in the early 1750s, it doesn't say where, we have an oral history written down in the early 20th century that actually makes more sense if the Madisons are living in the cottage or kitchen. And then we have an account from the Taylor side of the family that documents the use of the kitchen for temporary housing. So I present my evidence. Thank you, Hillary. Um, yeah, that's incredible, just the amount of detailed research. Um, Patrick noted that in the chat too, just all the research that went into figuring out you know, what it says on both the archeology, span the documentary record. And then Jen, I wanna turn it over to you and just ask how, based on all of that evidence, like what was the process for coming to this decision to um, call this like a planter's cottage? Sure, so part of the process as architectural historians, when we are looking to reconstruct or even restore a building is we look at all of the pieces. So like I said, we looked at the archeology, span the documentary um, record, but also we look at comparable structures. So that process led me to looking all across Virginia and Maryland and really looking at these small, you know, one room houses. So for most of the 18th century, most of the population lived in small buildings, 16 by 20, uh, was a common size and the kitchen happens to be just, uh, just over 16 by 20 feet. Um, and so we looked carefully at structures and I found a few examples. So one that survives, um, it's in uh, Northampton County on the Eastern shore of Virginia. And it's the image that's behind me in my, um, my background here. And that's called Pear Valley. And Pear Valley has a dendrochronology and dendrochronology is the study of tree ring data. So you can take us, you can take samples of the timbers in the house. Um, and as long as you have the bark edge, which is um, basically the end date of the timber, um, you can look, compare it to samples of the area um, and get a, a very definitive date, sometimes to the felling season. Um, so we know that Pear Valley was constructed in 1741. So that's very close to the time period that um, we think that the planter's cottage would have been constructed. Um, and then it's this one room building that's very close in size to uh, what was found archeologically at Montpelier. Um, it also has this large uh, fireplace. So you can see um, in this rendering kind of behind me, sorry, um, there's a fireplace right here. And it, it actually matches quite closely the size found archeologically at Montpelier as well. And we know from um, the documentary evidence and the records for this building that it was used as a house. So this was not built as a kitchen. This was always built as a house and it was built as a, for a middling um, kind of planter. Um, another house in the era um, is called Rochester House. It's built um, in Westmoreland County, Virginia. And it's also one room. And we actually have the probate inventories from numerous generations that lived in this house. Um, and it tells you exactly what furniture is in the building, uh, what, um, how sort of the building was used. And we know from documentary records that how many children actually lived in the house. So it, it's plausible that a house of this size, this kind of one room house with a, a loft upstairs could have been used for a, a large family. Um, and I think it makes sense at Montpelier, um, especially because um, James Sr. and Nellie Madison 
they're starting their marriage, they're starting their life. Um, and you know, he's just starting out as a planter basically. So he's, he's aspiring to this, this level. Um, and you know, eventually he builds the, the main house, uh, the big house. Um, but this is sort of a starter house for them. Um, and it's very similar to, you know, what we see throughout Virginia in the period. So I, I, I looked very carefully at those buildings. We went and visited them in person. Um, we did field notes and documentation, and they really helped us kind of flesh out the details of what uh, the planner's cottage would have looked like. Um, the other thing with the, the building is it shows archaeologically that it changed over time. So we know when um, it's turned into a kitchen in the early 19th century, we're finding areas of where they're using compass bricks. So those are the pie shaped bricks that are often used in the columns. So like the columns that are on the portico of the main house. We see that in the archeology span and some of the features. And that's telling us that they're modifying this building in the early 19th century because the earliest columns at Montpelier are 1797 and then the temple is 1812. Um, and so we know that we can date those bricks. Um, and that just tells us that it, it's changing. And there's also a shed addition that is added um, on the west side of the building. Um, you can see it behind Matt in the archaeology. And I think that's added again when they're changing it to a kitchen. So all of these things together help us better understand what the building would have looked like um, and how it would have functioned in the period. And you know, we uh, are very lucky that we have the full foundation of the building, that we have the artifacts that are coming out of the ground, and that we have the documentary record. And that just helps us piece it all together. It sounds like, yeah, each of those disciplines is kind of crucial in understanding the history of this building. Um, and when I was talking with you all, um, kind of in preparing for this panel, Matt, you mentioned that this building survived like several major changes to the landscape. Um, and it's associated with different people's lives. So obviously with James Madison Jr., the president, um, but also with the enslaved community as well. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you all can talk about um, maybe that aspect, like what are we finding from the enslaved community and you know what parts of the story, because obviously as you all have demonstrated, there's a very long and rich history with the structure. But when visitors come to the site, what do they learn about this? And kind of what's, how, how are these decisions being made about what stories of this place are being told? Yeah, I could start with this. The One of the most dramatic things we found at what began as, as the planter's cottage might have turned into an office in the, um, in the uh, post 1765 period and then became a kitchen in the 18 teens was most of the artifacts we found related to the last period, which is when it was used as a kitchen. And, and, and as Jen mentioned, there are features that we had found that showed that the building had changed, like the, uh, the um, th there's a little patch of the compass bricks that, that Jen mentioned right where my I'm pointing at my finger. But all around the building, what we found was not just artifacts related to this building as being a kitchen, but other artifacts that were clearly associated with the enslaved community. We found a number of transfer wares that don't show up in uh, the trash deposits associated with the, any, either generation of the Madisons, and they show up in, the, the, we have similar um, sets that are in other, area, other slave quarters. And there was also one artifact in particular that showed up right outside of the uh, the door, the the the, the uh, side door, right about in this area right here. I'm having a hard time pointing with my finger because everything is backwards. Right in this area right here, and this is um, this uh, ring that we located, and it's a um, it's a, a, car a carnelian uh, stone. Um, and when we found it, we weren't quite sure what it what it was. It was found in in um, in water screen deposits. And when we tested it, we realized based on how hard it was, it could scratch glass, that it was cryptocrystal and quartz. And the only type of cryptocrystal and quartz with this kind of coloration is carnelian. And when we had it tested, what we found was it is a true carnelian. It comes from, uh, the, uh, from India. And the carnelian is a stone that 
quite frequently where it's found, it's found in um, uh, African uh, diasporic contexts. Like when I did work in Jamaica, we found um, a carnelian bead in a burial. There's other burials in the um, uh, African burial um, project in, in Manhattan where th these were found. But this carnelian ring is really special because the context it was found is for the 1820s. And for this time period and earlier, for enslaved families who are buying many of their household and personal items at local markets, because they, be, they would be able to raise um, some uh, cash and barter with the vegetable and vegetables and, and small livestock that they raised, they would purchase items at market. There's actually account books that list Madison members of, of the enslaved community at Montpelier who have, have accounts at um, in Barbersville and, and in Orange at, at marketplaces. These, these sorts of rings, these kind of carnelian rings or beads were not available um, in, the, uh, in these markets at all. And we know this because in uh, the, you know, the uh, dozens of sites that I've excavated and, and uh, hundreds of other sites that I've, that I've analyzed, that we've analyzed, there's, in terms of the archeological record, it's, it's extremely rare to find carnelian, uh, either in the form of beads or rings. And so what it points to is that this ring is a um, is a uh, 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 an heirloom from Africa. This was a ring that would, would has has high potential to have been worn by someone who is um, kidnapped from Africa. This would have been in the 17 aughts, 17 teens, and then carried with them when they were transported to the New World. And then, since this is showing up in a building in deposits in the 1820s would have been passed down through generations and would have been curated until it was lost sometime in the 1820s. So this is an incredibly special ring. And so what it points to is, you know, the, 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 to the stories of the enslaved and the lives that were lived here. And it, this story is made even more special by its potential connection with a, with a, a modern day descendant, Betty Kearse, who's re recently written her history, her family history um, in a book that, um, where she documents that her one of her um, uh, great grandma great great grandmothers was a um, a uh, a um, cook in the in the kitchen for um, for the senior Madisons. Her name was Cor Corinne, and she would have been a cook in the kitchen sometime in the eighteen teens and the eighteen twenties. And there's a legend in her family of a red bead, and the red beads aren't that common. Usually they're white. Or um, or uh, milk glass, their glass beads. A red bead usually denotes carnelian. And when we found this, and we 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 talked to uh, Betty about this, you know, the connection was immediately made. Of you know, you know, could have this could this have been Corinne's? And this connection to her mother being born in Africa was one that came from this. So this, you know, this this ring is incredibly special meaning for. Uh, for members of the descendant community, especially Betty's family, in terms of the connection it represents to their ancestors. Because, you know, for most Black Americans, these kind of heirlooms don't, so don't survive, you know, both from slavery and then later on in the uh, transcontinental slave trade where Betty's family was sold from Montpelier to the Deep South, all, all their personal items would have been lost. And in this case, the, the, the fact that this got preserved in the archeological record in many ways allows the archeology span record to bear testimony to her ancestors being at Montpelier and the, and the lives that they would have led. And it's this connection that really is just incredibly important. And it's, a, it's a, for all of us descendants and you know, us as staff, is a, it's a sacred object that we hold very dear. And I think that kind of um, denotes another uh, important discipline, which is oral histories are crucial to this work too, not just the preservation, archaeology, or documentary records. So, um, and I want to um, ask. So obviously, Matt, Jen, and Hillary, the work that you've done with this has kind of demonstrated the importance of preserving this data, being able to identify, document, preserve. And I want to ask Tessa about some of the work she's currently doing to um, preserve some of, the, some of the data about Montpelier. 
Yeah, so we have a lot of legacy data. A lot of data has been collected over the years, a lot of research, all the findings. So there's all this information that isn't always obvious to visitors. There's a lot of hidden landscapes or landscapes that we can't always interpret all the time. So I think through things like digital media and digital technologies, there are ways to bring light to these hidden landscapes and to make them more visible to people through things like 3D modeling, like some of the things we have in the story maps with the sliders and to bring these landscapes to the public in a way that tells a story and tells a narrative um, in a way that they won't, they wouldn't get on an hour tour. Like there's just not enough time. And this also allows for our collection and all our knowledge to be available to the public. Because if it's not available to public and it's also not easily available to us digitally, then it's not really, there's not much use to it. And if we're not sharing it, then we're just aiding and helping keeping these landscapes invisible. Like we're aiding in not telling these stories, which isn't fair to the public. It's not fair to the people whose stories are not being told. So yeah, and that's, um, so I really love digital media and the way that we are working to really get all our collections on some type of digital platform for the public to view. And to your point, Tessa, um, all the information uh, that Montpelier has um, to, for tonight's talk, we had, I think, probably 10 times more to tell you than we're going to have in an hour. <laughs> um, but I want to ask, uh, I do want to open uh, it up for questions from the audience. But before we do that, I just want to ask any of the panelists if there's anything else you'd like to share with folks about the history of the Planters Cottage, things that there's, you know, things folks shouldn't walk away without knowing. Well, one thing, soon after the planner's cottage was uh, complete, um, I had the, the, uh, the fortune to, to do some of the tours at Montpelier soon after COVID. And having the planner's cottage on the landscape really allowed uh, it, it served as a reference point in talking with visitors about what Tessa is mentioning about some of these hidden landscapes in, you know, in, in a similar way when you're in front of the main house and I'm going to um, do switch around my screen here when you're in front of the main house, what you can see uh, of the main house is these three different periods and the three different periods are you know the, the main block of the house from 1765 to 1797 edition over here and the 1808 wings that are added. Well, similar, similarly with the planner's cottage, you've got this building that we've now reconstructed that's been there since 1750. And it allows you as, to use it as a framing to talk about you know, not just these hidden landscapes that are no longer there, but also as, as Tessa referenced as well, the, these hidden uh, stories that are not there, especially of the enslaved community and how this, this building changes over time and how in the 1820s for the period which we've restored it, what, have it, what it would have represented both as, um, as, a, as a kitchen for you know, the, the enslaved would have been working in, but then also as a, as a home. So this hidden landscape has you know, two different sides. There's the hidden landscape of previous periods that we don't interpret uh, through a restored landscape, like the period of the Revolutionary War, and the, 10 years later when Madison was writing the Virginia plan up in the, in, in the study, but then also it allows us to um, interpret a set of lives that have been hidden for you know, over 200 years, which is the enslaved Americans that built Montpelier and built this country, contributed to the labor and ideas that very you know, easily in history get ascribed to the great uh, uh, white men you know, Madison, Jefferson, Washington, and they, 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 a lot of the credit becomes all encompassing to those individuals where this was very much a, you know, a shared story and that the archeology span and the architecture and the, and the documents really bear this out because everyone's present in that. And there's no way to interpret any of this without being inclusive of all these stories. I don't have anything quite as profound as what uh, Matt just shared, but one thing that I will add is a question that comes up with visitors sometimes who are familiar with the fact that um, 
James Madison Sr. and Nellie Conway Madison had 12 children and they start thinking, how could you stuff 12 children into that building? And it's important to realize that the maximum number of children, I sat down and calcul calculated uh, birth years and uh, the year that the Madisons moved into Montpelier. So the maximum number of children would be five. Uh, it's the, the children who are born obviously earliest in birth order. Uh, there was a child who only lived for a month. So by the time uh, 1765, the children in the family would have been James, uh, Francis, Ambrose, Nellie, William, and possibly Sarah. So uh, I'm sure it felt crowded on a rainy day, but <laughs> other than that, it was fine. Tessa, we have a question in the chat about what's going on in the building behind you. Uh, okay, so um, this is actually a photo from probably, probably around 05, 06 of the main house under restoration. It has all the scaffolding up around the wings from where the roofs had been taken off. So um, what I study is mostly the restoration. I uh, digitize all the restoration records and I will plug my talk next week um, if you want to learn more about the restoration and things like this and how I digitize it, uh, tune in uh, next week for my talk with Katie about um, that project. And if other folks have questions, I would encourage you to go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and as we wait for folks to um, go ahead and, and ask their questions. I want to ask you all, so what, if a visitor comes to the site today and takes a tour, what are they going to hear on this tour about the Planter's Cottage? Well, if they come on my tour, <laughs> Uh, they will hear briefly about the Planner's Cottage because there are so many things to talk about that we don't spend as much time on the Planner's Cottage as I would like to. But certainly talking about the Planner's Cottage helps us trace the story of the family moving from one location to another and helps, I, I use it to contrast the different way that Madison Sr. organized the landscape compared to the way that Madison Jr. organized it. What, what I love to talk about with the Planner's Cottage is it, when, if you're visiting, you know, if you're visiting Montpelier in say 1755, there would have been, um, a, for the owner, owner's families, there would have been two separate households. And what's most interesting when you think about uh, the time period, James Madison Sr., would have been around uh, 30 at this time period. So you would assume that he would be, you know, the, the patriarch of the plantation. But his mother, who is still alive, the evidence suggests that she was maintaining the family seat down at Mount Pleasant. And the evidence for this is that they don't begin firing the first set of bricks or cutting the first set of trees to build the main house until she passes away in 1761. So it seems clear that it's only when she passes away that the mantle is passed and that James Madison Jr. begins the process of building what became the core of the main house uh, um, and was finished around 1765. So it's, and James Madison Jr. would have been witnessing all this. So the, the man who became the future president, the, the architect of the constitution, the idea of having, you know, uh, different factions that can work together. He would have witnessed this as a child. He would have seen, you know, his his, his grandmother running uh, and managing the tobacco part of the plantation, and then his parents running or managing the blacksmith operation, and then also uh, James Madison uh, Senior uh, had a was served as a merchant factor and basically sold goods to the local community. And so all this was under the umbrella of the Madison, the Montpelier plantation that brought these two factions together. Well, you know, some uh, 20 years later, he devises a way to bring these disparate states under the Articles of, of Confederation under a single 
umbrella of federal government and allows the, the factionalization of competition to actually enhance the ability for groups to work together and to diversify the country. So it's, I, I see this, you know, what we discovered through the architecture, the archaeology, and the documents is a, um, is a microcosm of what becomes the United States and some of Madison's founding ideas. So it's, a, it's you know, you think about where this comes from, you know, Madison wasn't born into a vacuum. He's a product of this land that we study in, the, in all the communities that were living here, the, um, the enslaved, um, multiple generations of Madison. So it really builds out the context and makes him more human and, you know, less godlike because he wasn't a god, he was a human. And the, it, this is how humans um, uh, learn is through, um, through their surroundings. Well, I'm wondering if any of you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with before we wrap up this evening. I think the fact that Planner's Cottage has such an intricate story associated with it, and you think about that as being one of many buildings on the mm -hmm. landscape and maybe one of the less lesser buildings on the landscape. It just makes you realize what a rich story there is to tell at Montpelier and many different layers and many different nooks and crannies to get into. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for your time and expertise. I think um, when we were kind of conceptualizing what this panel could look like, it was really important to have all of these disciplines represented because you can't tell the story of the planter's cottage without looking at the archaeology or comparing it in a preservation standpoint or you know without looking at the documentary evidence. So I think it's been a really strong conversation having all of you involved. Um, and I want to thank our audience for being here with us this evening. Um, and also encourage you all to come out to Montpelier this Saturday. Um, it's supposed to be a nice day, very warm. Um, we're basically having a number of programs in observance of James Madison's uh, birth. So the anniversary of his birth um, was yesterday. So we're doing a week long commemoration. And as Matt mentioned, he'll be leading an in-person cemetery tour at 1.30 on Saturday. Um, and then next week, we do have a virtual program, uh, Evening with the Experts, will feature Tessa Honeycutt uh, mm -hmm. on Thursday, March 24th at 7 p.m. So as you mentioned, Tessa, you'll be talking about kind of the current project you're working on, how you're digitizing thousands of records relating to the main house restoration um, and building this 3D model. Um, so that's going to be a fascinating talk, and I encourage all of you to show up to that. Um, and if you want any more information about our in-person or virtual programs, please check out the website at montpelier.org. Thank you all for being here this evening. Katie, thank you for putting this together and bringing us all into this. This is a great group of brilliant minds, so I'm privileged to be a part of it. So thank you all for, for being here. Um, I know you're very busy, so this has been fantastic. Well, have a wonderful evening, everyone, and stay tuned. Um, we will um, actually share the story map eventually once that's finished. Um, and I think I believe we can just take all the emails from this group and send it out. So um, it, that's going to be a fantastic resource. Thank you all. Have a good evening.